I've taken a slightly different tack. Um, what I thought Lauren had wanted us to do was to give a, an update on a couple of different projects uh, that have either been completed recently and, and published or are ongoing, just to give you an update on where we're at. Um, so hopefully each bit will be shorter, but the time adds up. So the three things, the three issues that I was hoping to touch on um, were one related to the whole issues of, of studies around brain fog in POTS, um, so more broadly, sort of neuropsych testing and potential interventions. Um, a study that got published uh, looking at the use of a breathing device in POTS to try and restrain heart rate. Uh, and then um, either because my PowerPoint numbering is failing or because it was so important it had to be a number one again. Um, <laughs> The Big Pot Survey, which is a, a study that we've just launched yesterday uh, at this meeting. So um, hoping that you'll hear about it and I'll rush to your computer to, to sign on. Um, so I'm not sure we need to belabor the background. I suspect the vast majority of you have, have heard of and probably experienced what's referred to as brain fog in POTS. I mean, in, in a broad sense, it's a vague and nebulous term, but something, touching upon something to deal with mental clouding, to deal with memory problems, to deal with concentration difficulties. Regardless of exactly what it is, and sometimes it's hard to sort of find the right words to describe it, it's actually one of the more disabling symptoms for a lot of our patients. You know, one of the challenges is, is what is it? Um, and so despite the frequency of complaints, there, there are some studies now, but I, I think, our, I believe this is the first study that we did where we actually did formal neuropsych testing, neurocognitive testing, to try and understand what it is that brain fog is. And part of this stemmed from a prior study that was done at Vanderbilt um, looking at sort of psychiatric issues in POTS and whether patients had DSM-4TR criteria, and for the most part they didn't. Um, but with the brief neuropsych testing actually, that what we found was that there was a problem with attention concentration. Right? P patients usually come to clinics saying they have memory problems, it actually turns out from that initial look that it was a concentration problem. So we ran a battery of tests, and there's just a smattering of the results here, but basically we, we studied 28 POTS patients and 24 healthy control subjects, because we're really asking is there a baseline abnormality, not does it get worse when you're standing up, um, which is an important question, but a different question. And we tried to find tests that address different aspects of, of neurocognition. Um, so there's some tests of executive function, so the Stroop test uh, is, is a color match test, right? It's a fairly commonly used test where um, you, stress, you stress the body because you sort of put colors up and you have to, you put words up, like blue, like words, color names up, and then you ask, and you have different colors up and you have to actually get the patients to talk about what color it is and not what the word is, and you have to concentrate a fair bit to do that. Um, and, and you can see it's, it's not that all our POTS patients were absolutely horrible at this compared to the control subjects, but as a group, they did worse, right? So there is a problem, and that, that's a test of, of what we call executive function. Um, then there were more specific sort of uh, speed tests, or there are rough tests that sort of are almost little sort of go through a maze of words type thing, um, and the POTS patients did worse on that, and that's a selective attention test, and then there's a simple digit test, which is a cognitive processing. So, the papers published, the, the details, if, if you're actually into neuropsych testing, are available, but this is just to point out that there are abnormalities that we were able to, to focus on. And the study was, you know, I was the PI on it, but largely it was run by Amy Arnold, um, who's a postdoc at Vanderbilt that will soon be employed somewhere else, sadly. Well, not for her, but for us. Um, so that's fine, so we basically found you found their abnormalities, and, and there's certainly some follow-on studies we can do, but again, most patients aren't, well, they are interested in is there something wrong, but they're more interested in what are you gonna do about it, right? And is there something that can be done about it? Um, and anecdotally, we've had patients take modafinil. Some tolerate it and some didn't, and we've done a prior study showing that its effect on heart rate, which is one of the concerns that it could actually worsen tachycardia, um, was actually relatively minimal at the doses that we were using, which is sort of 100 milligrams twice daily or per dose. And so we wanted to know whether this, we want to know still, we want it and still do, whether this can actually help improve cognitive function. Yeah, it's not happening, Ellen. Um, so there's an ongoing study right now that's at Vanderbilt. If you're interested, um, please contact them. It's gonna take a week of your life probably because basically involves coming in, um, getting baseline testing, and then we have four intervention days where we'd give you an intervention, we'd, 
check vitals periodically, and we actually have a computerized cognitive testing battery. So one of the challenges is you need something that's designed for repeated measures, right? A lot of the stuff we did in that initial assessment, part of the challenge is you've never seen it before. So if you do it again, you do better. And so if you're doing a study like this, you don't want people to do better just because they've seen the test. Um, so Coxate is an Australian tool that's designed, was designed originally for Alzheimer's, but for repeated assessments and studies. Um, and so four interventions, uh, modafinil, plus placebo, propranolol or placebo, the combination, because the combination we use a fair bit to try and counter the heart rate effects of modafinil, or just placebo. And so far we've studied six patients, all female, the, the demographics are here. They all, you know, on average there's significant orthostatic tachycardia. No data to show you yet, but, but the, study is, the study is ongoing and, and like I said, we'd, we'd love to have you if you're interested, although it does take, take a bit of time. The second thing I'll touch on is the whole um, story around the breathing device in POTS. And, this is a device that actually was developed um, as part of CPR algorithms and is used by the military. And that's actually how we heard about it. It's, it's a military tool used in the field for people that are bleeding out to try and get them, you know, to resuscitate them long enough to get them to, to a base hospital. And the whole idea uh, in the field is that by breathing through this, you have to, it, there's a resistance to breathing, right? So you put this on, it makes it harder to breathe. You have to suck harder to get air in which sounds great, doesn't it? Makes life more difficult. But the theory of what that does is that you, by sucking harder, you increase the negative pressure in your chest and you suck more blood back in to your heart. And so you can actually improve the venous return, the return to your heart, and improve the stroke volume, and in theory, improve the heart rate. Now, the latter parts of that are stuff we made up, right? I mean, in theory, you get the negative. We know it increases negative pressure. The rest of it we sort of made up as something that could happen. And that's what we wanted to test in the study. It was actually a physiologic study um, the device is shown here, so this is the device, this sort of orange thing, right? And you can see there's a little valve in it that, you know, you can, when you reach a certain threshold, you can move the valve and get air through. For the first seven centimeters of water of pressure you generate, you get nothing, no reward until you get above that, right? So you have to suck harder to get stuff. And we actually created a sham just using an air filter, and we were hoping that most of our patients weren't respiratory therapists and wouldn't recognize the difference. Um, and so we did, a cross, we did a crossover randomized study. And we want to test the hypothesis that we could actually increase the stroke volume and decrease the heart rate acutely in patients with POTS. It was, a, it was an afternoon study where you had, you know, you lay on a tilt table flat. We did it with the sham or the active thing first, tilted you up for 10 minutes, looked at cardiac outputs, put you back down, waited 20 minutes, and then repeated it with the other intervention, right? So in an afternoon, you were done with the study. The patient flow from the paper that's published is here. You can't read it. I couldn't read it. But we had 39 patients that were eligible, 37 randomized, and 26 were able to complete the 10 minutes of tilt, which was required because if we're looking at the hemodynamics, they didn't do the hemodynamics at the 10 minutes of tilt. It was, it was hard to compare. Um, and the arrows are here to help sort of, you know, uh, you know guide the direction because we're comparing different bits and bobs. But if you look at with tilt, the heart rate on top and the stroke volume on the bottom, the heart rate with the active device, the ITD, went up in response to tilt. Comp or sorry, the heart rate went down. The heart was lower with the ITD compared to the sham. Right, so it did, the ITD did restrain the heart rate. Perhaps next time I do this, the arrow should be this way. Um, similarly, the stroke volume was higher with the ITD. Right, so we actually did show that this works. And there are patients, uh, some patients liked it and others didn't, truthfully. But some of the patients liked it swear by it. And it's a little it was a little difficult to get. I think you can get it from medical supply houses now. Um, but at the time, people were calling us because their dog chewed on it and they didn't want to chew on it again afterwards. Um, but this is, a, this is theoretically a device that can be used as a rescue type device, right? So when you're feeling more tachycardic and feeling a bit worse acutely, this actually may improve the venous return to your heart and restrain your heart rate a little bit. Okay, and the final thing I wanted to introduce to you was, was what we're referring to as the Big Pot Survey, not the, the legal name of it. But it's an online survey that we actually, I first talked about two years ago at this meeting, we've been working on for a while. Um, you will not believe the bureaucracy involved in this. So it's a web, so really this is a, a large survey and we'll touch on what we're, we're asking about in the next um, slide. But we want to get around the fact that a lot of the research that's published, certainly in the US, comes from a handful of centers where if we added up all the patients that are in all of these papers, we're probably looking at less than 1,000, right? And these are probably very selected patients that are trekking to tertiary care centers to, to be seen. Um, and so we wanted to get a better cross-sectional sense of 
the POTS patient experience, um, including a lot of the stuff that anecdotally we hear from each of you about um, the cost that this has had on your life, both financial, social, friends, family, uh, frustrations with doctors. If there are great stories about doctors, throw them in as well. Um, you know, but, but basically there, there are a lot of issues that really there's really only anecdote and nothing to glom onto. And so this, with a lot of input from different patient groups, Dysautonomy International um, most significantly, um, we've created this sort of study that we're hoping a lot of people will glom onto. And this slide sort of addresses some of the sections in it. It is long. It'll take you 30 minutes to complete if you're reasonably fast. Um, you can save every page and sort of come back to it if you need to. It's sort of set up recognizing not everyone's going to be able to get through it at once. Key things. Um, the way we set this is done through the Vanderbilt IRB. And so for the IRB, they need to know that only adults can consent legally, right? And if you're in hospital, they can talk to a child and check with parent and all that. But since we're doing this web-based, you get through it and consent is, is on the first page when you click on the link. And if you move on, it's assumed that you are agreeing to the consent. Because of that, only patients, not only patients, only people 18 years or older can complete the survey. That means patients 18 years or older can complete the survey, and parents can complete the survey for those under the age of 18, right? So you can be by your side. You can do it on behalf of a child that's set up for that. But strictly speaking, child under 18 cannot complete survey by self because we can't verify parental consent otherwise, okay? So I don't want you to think that we're excluding the people younger than 18, but there's a regulatory reason why the parent officially needs to be the one completing the survey. Okay, so the, the links are here. Um, I suspect many of you are quite familiar with the Dysautonomy International website, and there are links from that site. There's also a bit.ly link um, that may eventually go to, straight to the survey. I think right now is actually going to this web page on the Dysautonomy International site. And the idea of the bit.ly link is that we would love for those of you more involved in social media than me, which is actually 100% of you, I suspect, um, <laughs> Love to have you send this to your, your friends and your you know, Facebook pals and all that and tweet it out and you know, any other social media thing I've left out by accident. Um, and try and get a lot of people involved. I expect most people will be from, from the US. We did run it by one of the British groups to try and be a little Anglo sensitive in terms of language. For those of you who had my elevator escalator <laughs> trauma yesterday. It turns out a lot of things that are a little bit different. Um, so we'd love to get people from around the world. And you know, our initial goal was about 2,000 people. Lauren now tells me that we should be able to do that in a week, and maybe we should set our targets at 5,000. But really, it, it can be a, a, a wealth of information that um, will be useful uh, at many levels. I mean, Lauren, I think, is interested in getting some of this information to lobby uh, to basically quantify disability. Thank you very much.